Galatians chapter number 2. We're going to read verse number 20. Amen. And we want to say a big thank you for those that planned our little gathering last night at the Essen House. Had a lot of fun. Amen. Ate way too much food. But that's the great thing about an all-you-can-eat buffet. I'd look over at Brother Van Rutledge and he would be like, Put another pot of food to his mouth. And I ate way too much. I don't know. And it got time to eat the pie. And the chocolate cream pie came out. I was like, I can't resist that. It's only ate half of it. And then my sister Amy, she's like, well, you got to eat the whole thing. So I just felt like, man, just kept shoveling it in. But I got it all in there somehow. But we had such a good time with everybody. Amen. Galatians chapter 2, beginning at verse number 20. The Bible says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We have read this scripture, and if you haven't, maybe you've heard the song. It's a popular song by Phillips, Craig, and Dean. I think they were the original writers of it. I don't know. But they sing a song that is called Crucified with Christ. And the chorus says this, I am crucified, I'm not going to try to sing it, don't worry about it. I'm crucified with Christ, and yet I live. Not I, but Christ that lives within me. His cross will never ask for more than I can give. For it's not my strength, but His. There's no greater sacrifice, for I am crucified with Christ, and yet I live. If you've ever read the verse or you've listened to that song, it really doesn't seem like something that you would want to say or that you would want to say. Because if you understood the process of crucifixion, I don't know that any of us would get up and say that I am crucified with Christ. I thought I started thinking about that a couple weeks ago. Why in the world would somebody say that I am crucified with Christ? Crucifixion is an ancient method of painful execution in which the condemned person is tied or nailed to a large wooden cross and left to hang until dead. Now, I was going to drag our cross from the basement, the one that we used for our Easter play, but realized I probably would fall off or break it. I'm not going to, but most of you know what the cross looks like. Uh, it was there. It was a place of pain. It was... An execution, a large wooden cross. And the term crucifixion comes from the Latin crucifixio, meaning fixing to a cross, and cruci, C R U C I, meaning uh, cross and fix or to bind fast. This is something that we normally talk about around Easter. It just so happens Easter is a couple months away, so we're getting a little bit of a head start on the crucifixion. But the crucifixion was often performed in the old days to terrorize and dissuade witnesses from per or perpetrating particularly heinous crimes. What they would do is if you did something that was terrible, something awful, that they would take you and they would give you a crucifixion. And victims were left on display after death as warnings to others who might attempt the descent. It was a slow and a painful process. Hence, we have the term excruciating, because right in the middle is a C-R-U-C-I, meaning out of crucifying. Excruciatingly painful, it was gruesome, it was humiliating, and it was made public, which was the whole purpose, because they wanted everybody to see what you were going through, so hopefully they wouldn't commit murder and commit rape and all of these other really bad crimes. In some places, they would have to carry, if you look at Jesus' crucifixion, he had to carry his cross from one point to the place of the crucifixion. Some of them would have to carry the cross, and it would be well over 300 pounds dragging this wooden cross from the destination of their sentencing to the place that they were going to be crucified. Some of them, if they didn't have to carry the full cross, would have to carry just the cross beam part, which was, they say, an estimated between 75 and 125 pounds. So depending on how long of a walk that you had to take, I mean, carrying an extra 300 pounds is a whole lot of work to be carried. Made your body extra weak, so when they nailed you to the cross or they tied you to the cross, you would not have the strength to be able to kind of hold yourself up. Because what would happen, 
happened is why you are sitting on this cross. Especially if they used the nails. And they nailed it in your hands and, and in your feet. That the weight of your body would begin to, the gravity would begin to take effect. And it would pull you towards the earth. And eventually, you know, you're, you just have skin and muscle and tissue. So the skin would begin to rip and begin to tear. So you would find yourself kind of sliding downward on the cross. In the meantime, your back, after most of the time the crucifixion was taking place, after you had already received some type of beatings, 40 stripes save 10 or 40 stripes save 20, whatever it might be. So their back is already messed up from being whipped. So as they're hanging on this cross and the gravity begins to pull them downward, now their back is getting splintered up because it's rubbing against the wood and, and their open wounds begins to bleed and their feet begins to slip. And so all this weight is pulling them towards the earth. In the process of doing this, it says the length of time required to reach death could range anywhere from a few hours to a few days, depending on the method they nail to the cross or if they are tied to the cross, depending on the victim's health and the environment that they are in. Death could result from any combination of causes, including blood loss resulting in hypovolemic shock. Sepsis could set in because of the infection of the wounds caused by the nails or the wounds that they occurred on their back from being beaten. Eventually, if that didn't take their life, then it could be dehydration or they uh, asphyxiated. They couldn't breathe anymore. And because of this, the weight of their body, as they were being crucified, that it would begin to stretch their, their, their lungs and stretch their midsection. So when they would try to breathe, they would have to push on their legs to try to reach up because of the angle that your arms were. It didn't allow airflow to go into your lungs very easily. So what they would have to do if you were hanging on the cross is you would have to push down on your feet to try to pull your body up so you could grab a breath. But because you had to carry a cross of 300 pounds a few miles, your legs don't have enough strength to really lift yourself up. So you have enough strength to kind of just push yourself up, take a breath, and then let your body sag down because your legs aren't strong enough to hold you up. So throughout a few hours to maybe a day to maybe even two days, a long, drawn-out, excruciatingly painful process. It talks about when you're crucified that they would suspend with their arms at a 60-degree angle, which had difficulty breathing. Subjects did suffer rapidly increasing pain, which is consonant with the Roman use of crucifixion to achieve a, pro a prolonged, agonizing death. And to make it worse, so they couldn't constantly push themselves up, then they would go out and they would break their legs. Their legs are broken. They didn't have enough strength to pull themselves up. So it caused them not to be able to breathe even more. You think the trauma, crucifixion was great. But yet Paul refers to this in his writings in Galatians saying that he is crucified with Christ. Why would anybody want to go through that? We look at what Jesus went through. You look at other stories. You can go online and Google it and you can see. Actually, there was a, a of course, it's a man-made video, but you can see even today in the Middle East, there are people that do that once a year that will willingly sacrifice themselves to be beaten and to be hung on a cross for a few hours. Some of them pass away, some of them live, but they do this every single year. So why in the world would Paul say, I am crucified with Christ? I'm thinking, man, if I had to go through all that stuff, I'm going to hightail it. I'm going to go the other direction. I don't want anything to do with crucifixion. I get mad if I get a paper cut, let alone some of these other things. So how, why would he want to go through all of this? Jesus went through it, but he's wasn't talking about a physical crucifixion, but a spiritual crucifixion. He was stating that he needed to die out to the flesh and his earthly desires. So it is no longer him that lives, but it is Christ that lives within him. He said, I am crucified with Christ, but yet I live. Not I, but Christ that lives within me. Paul understood that no flesh can glory in his presence. He knew that if he was going to be the vessel that God could use, if he was going to be this great missionary and write a majority of the New Testament, that his flesh could have nothing to do with this. So he willingly said, I am crucified with Christ. So it's not me that does it. Everything I do is about God. Romans 6 and 
6 says this, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. We have to understand that when we are baptized, the Bible refers to it that you are burying yourself. So the old man, the Bible says, is under the water and you come up a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. Every day that we are alive, we face this thing called our flesh. Something that we can never get away from because we are made from flesh. From the very beginning of the garden, beginning in the Garden of Eden, he created man out of the dust of the earth and he became a living soul after he breathed in him, but they became flesh. So ever since Adam, all the way to where we are now, and all the way until the Lord comes back, we are going to battle flesh. He said, we are old man is crucified with him. In 1 Corinthians 15, 31, Paul says at the end of that verse, he says, I die daily. Every day that we wake up, we have choices. There are decisions that we are going to make. Your flesh wants to do one thing, but your spirit wants to do something else. When you wake up in the morning, the first thing you want to do, I'm sure, is not roll over and pray. But you want to get up, you got to use the restroom, you got to eat some breakfast, you got to get dressed, and you go to work. There are choices that we make. But if we don't die daily, if we don't sacrifice ourselves, if we don't crucify our flesh on a daily basis, then are we really living for Christ or are we really following after the flesh? Are we following after the devil? Every day is a decision. Are we going to die out to the world? And let our spirit live? Or are we going to kill our spirit and let our flesh live? These are choices that we make on a daily basis. Romans chapter 8 says this. We're going to spend a lot of time here. Verses 5 through 18. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, meaning fleshly minded. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. We can be going about our day trying to be a light, trying to be a witness, trying to be the person that God wants us to be. But if we don't wake up in the morning and die out to the flesh, then what are we, what example are we really being? Because throughout the day, if we don't start off in the morning getting ourselves right with God, maybe taking a few minutes of prayer or reading the Bible or even while you're taking a shower, pray or sing. I sing in the shower, so you know, it's a great time to have a long time with God. I pray driving in my car. I get some alone time doing insurance. I drive here and there, so I get some time to be alone with God every day. But if I don't take that time, I notice that my day doesn't really go as spiritually as I want it to go. Not saying that I go out and we just sit like crazy, but some of the opportunities that we have, we're, we're not open to them. Our mind, our spiritual mind is closed down to the person that was put in our pathway, and it seems like it's coincidence, and it seems like it's by accident, but really everything was orchestrated by God, and if we are not spiritually minded, and if we haven't put on the helmet of salvation and thrown on the armor of God, some of these opportunities that God presents to us on a daily basis, we just, oh, sure, yeah, I'll help you out and do this, then you go on your way. But that could have been that time and that moment that you could have shared something about Jesus Christ that could have changed or altered their life forever. Sometimes throughout our day, maybe you say things you shouldn't have said. You think things you shouldn't have thought. You do some things that you shouldn't have done. Because every day, it's flesh versus spirit. It's carnal mind versus the spiritual mind. And if we are in the flesh, it says that we're not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can we be. Because if we're in the flesh, we cannot please God. Every day that I wake up in the morning, I want to do something that is pleasing to God. There's a song by Casting Crowns, and I can't remember the name of it, but Oh My Life Song, Sing to You. It talks about all of this, and at the end of the day, would you put a stamp on it? Would you smile at my day? Did I do something worthwhile to touch you? Did I do something like that? I think it's a life song. song. If not, it's one that's on that album somewhere. It talks about, at the end of the day, are you going to smile at my day? Are you going to put a stamp on it saying, I have approved of this day because you did everything right. You were spiritually minded. If we're in the flesh, then we cannot please God. If we're not pleasing God, that's not a good thing. Verse 9, but you are in the, you're not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit. If so be, the spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if any man have 
not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And I, by Christ, be in you, and your body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. That's why it's so important to have the Holy Ghost. If you do not have the Holy Ghost, if you don't have that spirit of God living inside of you, then that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, if it's not in you, then when Jesus comes back or you pass away, it's going to be hard trying to get up out of that ground because that same resurrection power is not in your life. So today, just a side note, if you do not have the Holy Ghost, today is a great day to find an altar of repentance and die out to the sin and die out to the ways of, of the natural way of thinking and the fleshly mind and some of the actions that you've been doing. And you can put on the mind of Christ and you can have that spirit inside of you. So if something were to happen, you have the resurrection power. So get the Holy Ghost. Today's a great day to do it. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, but to live after, after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, then ye shall live. Mortify, meaning to kill. Once again, Paul is saying numerous times, I die daily. I am crucified with Christ. If you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds or kill the deeds of the flesh, then ye shall live. In other words, every day we need to die to Jesus. We need to make sure that every day when we get up, we are surrendering our will to His will. We need to make sure the choices we make are not the choices of our natural man or what we think is right, but rather we are made through the Spirit of God. We need to kill our desires of flesh and lust. We need to kill our desire for drugs and alcohol. We need to surrender to God and just say, it's not about me. It's not about what I want, but it's about you and it's about what you want. It's not my will, but yours be done. Paul said in Romans 7, 18, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Paul says, I know that is in my flesh. There's no good thing here. So if you don't have the Spirit of God, and if you're not flesh or spiritually minded, and if you're not walking in the Spirit, your flesh, there's no good thing here. Your flesh wants to sin. Your flesh wants to be disobedient. Your flesh wants to tell lies. Your flesh doesn't want to do anything spiritual. You think your flesh wanted you to get up and come to church this morning? I highly doubt it. I don't think your flesh said, hey, get up. It's time to go to church and you're all happy. No. But I bet before you went to bed or maybe you were thinking about God and thinking about church and you were saying, man, I cannot wait to get into the house of the Lord. You felt like David. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Your flesh doesn't say that, but your spirit does. Your flesh doesn't want to wake up in the morning and get dressed and take a shower and get your kids together, get everything there because you got to be in prayer at 1030 and you got all this stuff to do. Your flesh doesn't want to do that. Your flesh wants to stay in a nice cozy bed because I was comfortable this morning. I felt like I could have slept for years. I had too much food last night. I could have passed out and not woken up in 2015. It would have been fantastic. But hey, it's time to get up. It's time to go to church because spiritually, my mind says there's something great that's going to happen in the house of the Lord today. And I can't afford to stay home. I can't afford to miss this because this could be the day that somebody receives the Holy Ghost. And this could be the day that somebody receives the healing. And this could be the day that someone's life is changed forever. My spirit says, you cannot miss this. Get your rear end out of bed. Let's get up and let's get moving. I've got to get myself to the house of God. And the decisions that we make. Jesus said, he was in the garden. He said, it's not my will, but yours be done. The difference thing about us and Jesus was Jesus knew exactly what he was going to go into. He knew in the garden the, the process and the pain that he was about to endure. And he was praying, God, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. You think that was his spirit praying? No. That was his mind. That was his flesh saying, I don't want to go through this. I know what a crucifixion is. I know the beating that I'm about to take. I know the crown of thorns that's going to be on my head. I know that I'm going to hang on this 
cross for hours and could be days. And I know I'm going to have nails in my hands and in my feet. And I know I'm not going to be able to breathe. And, and it's, it's embarrassing. It's humiliating. They're hanging on the cross and they're naked. And if they have to use the rest of it, they just have to go. And it's down on the pole and the birds would come and peck at their flesh and peck at the feces that are coming off their body. Do you think that the flesh of Jesus really wanted to go through all of that? No. But he looked down the line and said, not my will, not the will of my flesh, but your will be done, or the will of the Spirit. That's why Paul says, I've got to crucify my flesh every single day. I've got to make sure that it's dead because Jesus paid the ultimate price for us. He could have easily turned around and walked away. He could have easily at any moment called a legion of angels to come down and get him off that cross. But he didn't do it. His flesh surrendered to the will of God. And he hung there on a cross until he died. And he did it because he loved you and I so much that nothing was going to interrupt the plan that God had for you. He, nothing was going to interrupt the fact that on this Sunday morning, you were going to be in the house of God with an opportunity and a chance to impact your world. He said, nothing is going to change that. So my flesh is going to surrender to my spirit, to the spirit of God. Every day that we wake up, why can't we make that same choice? God, I'm going to die out to my flesh. I know it's about making money and I've got to do this and that, but God, my mind is going to be on the spiritual side. And I'm going to be open to opportunities that when people come in my way, that I'm going to say, hey, how can I reach out to them? What can I say? God, use me as a vessel. When it comes time to make choices, if you're addicted to drugs and alcohol, if you're addicted to other things, if you put on the Spirit of God, if you put on God in your life, those choices get a little bit easier. It's not easy to wake up in the morning and kill the flesh, but once you do it, it's easier throughout that day. If you wake up in the morning and you say, man, I am going to put on Jesus Christ today. I'm going to be an ambassador for Christ. I'm going to be that living epistle that God tells me to be. And I'm not going to make these bad choices. And I'm going to lean on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to trust Him with all of my heart, my mind, my soul, my body, and strength. Because I know in my flesh, there's nothing here, but if I want to be a vessel that God can use, then I've got to put on the Spirit. So we have to kill the deeds of the flesh. We have to kill our desires, kill our wants, kill our will, and surrender it to God. That's why fasting is so powerful. Because you're learning to conquer the toughest thing there is to conquer, which is the power of eating, the appetite. You wake up in the morning. If you've ever done an extended fast, you wake up in the morning. Whether you started at night or whatever, but if you started at dinner, by the time you wake up in the morning, if you're like me, your stomach's growling, you're ready to roll, and you just want to eat, eat, eat. But you keep going, and you just grab a bottle of water, you grab, a, you know, whatever you get from the faucet, and you're just ready to roll. But it's a conscious decision that we're going to crucify our flesh, we're going to crucify that desire. And what begins to happen, the longer you fast, greater things begin to be revealed. I've heard, and I've read books of visions being seen, and, and even Bishop Ebright would tell us stories of, how he would be there and angels would come in and minister to him. And all of these great things begin to take place. But when you get your mind in the spirit world, then everything, your outlook is completely different. We have to wake up, crucify our thoughts, our desires, our dreams, our ideas, and put on Christ. Because it's not me that lives, but I want Christ to live within me. Verse 14. For as many as are led by the spirit... Led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness to our, with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, we, might, we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Paul said, I know this crucifixion is going to hurt. I know that it, it's not the greatest thing. I know dying daily isn't a fun process. But the sufferings of this present world, making the decisions for God instead of living for myself. Living for somebody else instead of living for myself. I know the suffering of that is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. If you can crucify your flesh now and live after the Spirit now, then you're going to...
going to find yourself in heavenly places. But if you don't crucify your flesh now, then you will find yourself in eternity in a constant state of pain and torment. Why not crucify it now so you can live eternity with God and with the angels, the streets of gold, the gates of pearl? Instead of living for yourself now. Seems like because we don't, in our minds, we just don't process eternity. We don't process the fact that there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. We don't process the fact that the choices we make, if we live after the flesh, are, we're making the conscious decision that when the Lord comes or we get killed or taken from this earth, whichever one happens first, we're making the conscious decision that we want to spend our life in hell. But why not crucify our flesh every day, live after the Spirit, and know that there is a heaven again, that I can be with Jesus Christ forever, the one who gave himself for me. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26, says this. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited? If you gain the whole world, if you live after the flesh and you live it up and it seems like you have the best life possible, what profit is a man if he gains the entire world and he loses his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So if you're going to follow after me, deny yourself, deny the flesh. Deny the things that you want to do. Deny the ministry that you think you need to be in and follow after Jesus Christ. Take up your cross and follow me. It works perfectly with what Paul said. I am crucified. Jesus said, take up your cross. Paul said, now you're going to be crucified. Take up your cross and follow after me. If you save your life, you're going to lose it. So if you live your life how you want to right now, thinking you're saving it, you're not crucifying it, you're not dying out to the flesh, then eventually... You're going to lose your life. You're going to find yourself waking up to a place that the worm dieth not, and it is hot, and it is painful and excruciating. But he said, if you're willing to lose your life, if you're willing to deny yourself, if you're willing to, to let go and let me have my way in your life, if you're willing to make yourself a vessel that I can use, then you're going to lose your life now. And yeah, it seems like, why, why even bother going through it? Why bother crucifying the flesh? Why go through that pain now? That's the, the battle that goes on in your mind. Why go through it right now? Because you can live a lot better life. But we're not living a life here. We're just strangers and pilgrims. We're just here visiting. Because our home is not this earthly, this world. Our home is not here, but our home is in heaven. I don't want to save it and live the life right now. I want to sacrifice and give it all to Jesus Christ and be a vessel that God can use. I want to be like Paul and be like Jesus Christ that constantly surrender their fleshly will to the Spirit because that's where the revival is. Every time somebody submitted their flesh to their spirit, something great happened. Constantly throughout the Bible, people were saved, they were healed, they were delivered. But it was not about them, but it was about God. But it was not about their own motives, it was about God's motives. Then everything began to take place. Mark chapter 14 Verse 37 through 39, we find Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's ready to pray. He leaves Peter, James, and John and tells them, You pray here, I'm going to go over yonder and I'm going to pray. The Bible says, And he cometh. Jesus is coming back to where the disciples are, finding them sleeping. Saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed and spake the same words. Our spirit is truly ready. I do believe that. I believe that in our minds, we, our spirit is ready for revival. That we are ready to deny our flesh. And we'll say that, you know, hey, we're going to pray and we're going to fast and we're going to be a light and we're going to be a witness and I'm going to worship. The spirit indeed is truly willing, but... Sometimes the flesh is weak. When we make the commitment to God that, you know what, I'm going to pray every day at home. I'm going to pray for 15 minutes a day. 
Your spirit, I believe, is truly willing. Brother Klein, you're ready to pray those 15 minutes. You're willing to do that. But then all of a sudden, phone calls come in. I try to, in my day, I schedule out at least, hopefully, at least a half hour a day where I can spend just a long time with God throughout the day. But sure enough, do you think the devil wants that free time to be spent in prayer and in reading and in studying and in fasting and all that stuff? No, he doesn't. So I get phone calls from clients. I get phone calls from church people. I get text messages. I've got this and that coming. And my boss wants to do this. and all. I mean, all of a sudden, that time that you blocked out is you're getting bombarded with every little thing you can think of. Your spirit is willing, but then your flesh says, no, I've got to do this and I've got to do this and I've got all these other things to do. Or I'm going to pray before I go to bed every night, but as soon as you hit the pillow and you start, oh, God, we love you. <laughs> Whoa, that was a good prayer, man. How long did I pray? Like, you know, rooster's crowing, your alarm's going off. Like, man, I prayed all night. Your spirit is willing. You want to make those choices. But that flesh sometimes says, hey, JT, you're too tired. You need to curl up in that bed and go to sleep. You know, you need to eat this food. You need to take care of this because this is so important. Your boss is going to chew you out if you don't get this done. Or, you know, your wife's been calling you four or five times. You need to call her back. And you got to run to the grocery store. you got you got so much. So the devil tries to use all this busy stuff and try to distract us. So we're not living after the spirit, but we're living after the flesh. So it's a constant battle. Are we going to live after the spirit or are we going to live after the flesh? Jesus said your spirit is ready. But your flesh is weak. That's why every day when you get up, you've got to put on the mind of Christ. God, I'm going to live my life for you this day. I don't care what comes in. I'm going to make the right choices. I'm going to live my life after the Spirit and not after the flesh. Not my will, but your will be done. I'm tired of living after my own will. Because if we live after our own will, we are absolutely doomed to fail. Absolutely doomed to fail. God says, my ways aren't your ways. My thoughts aren't your thoughts. So quit following after your own stuff and follow after me because I know the end. I know the thoughts I have towards you. I know the plan that I have laid out for you from the beginning of the world, from the foundation of the world. I have this already mapped out. If you would just follow after me, I'm going to lead you. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to take care of you. So don't live after the flesh, but after live after the spirit. Every day, somebody can come and play, I don't know, somebody can come play a keyboard. Every day, it's a, con it's a conscious decision. Are we going to live after the flesh, or are we going to live after the spirit? Paul says, if I'm going to be the vessel that God wants me to be, I've got to crucify my flesh. I have to die daily. I have to mortify the deeds of the flesh. <laughs> so if you are here and you are doing things that is contrary to the word of God, crucify it. Kill it. Get it out of your life. You're facing depression and oppression and all these things. Let's crucify it and let's get it out of your life. Don't be a slave to sin. Don't be a slave to your flesh, but let's live in liberty in the spirit. Don't operate how you think you should operate. Don't do things how you think it is, but trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. All your ways acknowledge Him. He will direct your paths. Crucify the flesh. It's not easy. Nobody said it would be easy. Jesus struggled with it. He sweat three drops of blood. He was sweating blood. That's how intense it was of the battle of the flesh versus the spirit. <clears throat> but we can't have both. You can't live both ways because the double minded man, you're unstable in all of your ways. You can't live on Monday after the flesh because we don't have church Monday and Monday night. You can't live for God just on Sundays because we have church. Or you can't live for the world on Thursday, but then, oh, 7 o'clock comes around, we're ready, i got to live after the Spirit, I'm turn on my spiritual mind. It doesn't work that way. God wants you, He wants all of you, from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, your mind, your heart, your spirit, everything that you have, everything that you are, God wants you. 100% of the time, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. God wants you. And he sacrificed everything to be able to share that, to be able to say, I've done it. I, I, I know what it's like. I know what it's like to battle the flesh and the spirit. Jesus was tempted at all, at all points, just like we were. But yet he was found without sin. So if we live after God, if we live after the spirit, he's going to give you that overcoming power. 
to make the right choices, to do the right things, to say the right things, to be the right example all the time, every day, every day. Let's all stand together. I must crucify my flesh. Can we just lift our hands in here this morning? Let's lift our hands all over this place. Father, help us today. We are in a constant battle with flesh versus spirit. We were born into sin. We're shaped in iniquity. We, this is all we know. It's our human nature to want to rebel. It's our human nature to want to go against you and not be obedient. To kind of do what we want, how we want, when we want to. But God, today I'm asking that all of us here in this place would begin to surrender our will to your will. Our thoughts to your thoughts. Our desires to your desires. And our dreams to your dreams. Our ministry to your ministry. The ministry that you have for us. Because God, it's truly not about us. It's not about our flesh. But God, it is about you. It is about having you uplifted and raised in our life. She said, if I be lifted up, I would draw all men. And we want you lifted up in, in our lives. Because we know the wages of sin is death. If we live after our flesh, there's nothing out there but death. But God, you want to give us eternal life. You want us to be great vessels that revival can be sparked through. You want us to be vessels that harvest can be brought in and reaped. You want us to be the vessels that we can go out to the highways and byways and compel somebody to come in because we're not living after the flesh, but we're living after the spirit. And I pray, God, that you would give us the strength that every day choice that needs to be made, that we would not just make it irrationally and just for the first thing that comes to our mind, but God, that we would surrender our will to your will, our thoughts to your thoughts, and say, God, what do you want us to do? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to proceed? Is this something that I should do, or is this something that I can do without? What do you want for me to do? Help us, God, to crucify our flesh, so it's not us that lives, but it's you that lives within me. Give you all the praise this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We love you. The children will be down in just a minute or two. Why don't you greet somebody, shake their hands, welcome them to the house of the Lord. Amen. We will start our evangelistic service in just a few moments.